Okay, just a moment. <laughs> um, I have a backup recording too going. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to our monthly Ayurveda and trauma healing, emotional well being workshops. This whole series on our first Wednesdays of each month this year, 2022. Um, we're really centered around um, the all the pillars of health. So the three primary pillars of health and well-being. The last several months, we dove into different aspects and parts of the biological pillar of health, where we talked about how to reset the gut, re uh, regulating the nervous system, um, subtle energy practices, and how the subtle energy pranic body comes into play and how it's the interface between the mind, emotions, and physical health. And so now this month marks the beginning of diving more into the emotional specifics of the emotional um, health and well-being and resolving stuck emotions, resolving blockages that might be happening in our pranic body as it relates to um, uh, as it relates to physical health, as it relates to just basically the integration and merging between um, mental, emotional health and clarity and how that ties into physical healing. So today we're going to go into, I'm going to share a little bit um, from the Ayurvedic perspective around the six stages of dis-ease or how um, basically, it's the six stages of disease progression, known as samprapti in Ayurveda. And these six stages are how we can learn how we got to a current state of health imbalance, but also how to reverse the six stages. So we're going to be talking about those six stages today. And then in particular, we're going to highlight where the mind and emotions come into play and how they can you know kind of keep us stuck in a certain um pattern of health experience of our physical body and then um and then we're going to dive into this the the distinction between your true self which is your connection to divinity which is the, the, the soul, the spirit that is inhabiting your body that has been born into this world with this physical body. And we're going to explore how the connections between connecting to true self and how to heal and guide the parts of you that are disconnected from that, that have forgotten, that have gone awry in some way in order to that and, and how that creates kind of like um, physical health challenges. But we're going to really highlight some more nuance around the parts of you that have imprints or that are, you know, tend to be really maybe highly create a highly sensitive nervous system or that may have trauma or that may have past pain that's unresolved or that might be resolved on some levels, like, like if we had a traumatic experience in the past or endured abuse of some type, there might be a part of us that really has found forgiveness and sees the bigger beauty and picture of it all, but there might still be a somatic trigger, right, in the body when you're facing a circumstance that reminds your body of the trauma or the pain, and so how do we work through that how do we resolve that when then there's like this split there's like but i know that like i'm safe <laughs> and i know that this reality isn't then but my body doesn't know that right so we're going to discuss that today and how to how to bridge the healing into the somatic realms um so yeah that's just a brief intro to what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm happy you're all here live. And I'm happy if you're listening to this as a recording, I'm happy you're here with me in the recording realm. And I hope this information serves you. And as always, um, 
as always, we're going to start today with a little breathing practice, centering. Um, I'll read you a meditation sutra, a meditation poem for a brief moment of contemplation and connection so that you're having an experiential um, dropping into that true self that we'll then talk about cognitively. Because as probably all of you know, as highly sensitive empaths, spiritual seekers, holistic health enthusiasts and health seekers, um, it's all about the embodiment. It's like, we might know something, but how can I experience that? Like in the deepest way, like know it, not just in my mind, but know it in my bones, know it in my heart, know it uh, amidst any, any adversity coming from the external realm. So that's why we start with these practices to continually cultivate that, that knowing and that connection. So let us begin. So let's just take a moment to come to a comfortable seat and you can start to roll your shoulders up, back and down. Make sure your hips feel solid and grounded. And if your legs are cross-legged, um, allow them to feel like a solid base with your belly open, like hips kind of tilted open. And if that doesn't feel like a solid base, whatever is the most solid base. If you're sitting in a chair, come forward to the edge of your chair, place your feet flat on the earth and knees just comfortably apart, like hip width and really feel your feet. So bringing that energy and awareness down there to your base, take a few deep breaths and lifting up through the spine and releasing any tension out of the shoulders. We're not trying to get anywhere, just be really present with any movements of releasing tension. And then even just micro movements. I don't need to be able to see you in the video that you're moving. And then just bring your right ear to your right shoulder and maybe tucking the chin down and lifting it up and just starting to bring a little openness into the side of your neck. You can tilt your spine over to the side just a little bit as well, if that feels good. And come back up to center and bringing left ear to left shoulder and tipping down and tucking the chin back and forth, just opening the sides of the neck and the side body, coming back to center. And then just inhaling, bringing your heart forward, chin up to the ceiling. And then exhaling, tuck the chin down and concave your back, rounding your shoulders forward. Inhale, arching chin up. And exhale, tuck and round. Coming back to center. Final little movement is just turning your head all the way to the right, twisting your spine very gently. This could even be micro movements for you. And then twisting gently and slowly to the other side. And then back to center. And just bringing your awareness down to your lower abdomen, lower belly. Inhale, allowing the belly to soften and relax. So as you inhale, the navel should move away from your spine. And as you exhale, you draw it in towards your spine. Inhale, it moves away from the spine. Exhale, it moves towards. And if you have any trouble with this at all, you can place your hands on, the, on your belly. Try to allow the chest to stay relaxed and the movement to only happen in the lower abdomen. Just taking a full, a few full deep breaths. And we're gonna go into our three part breathing. So you're starting here with the lower abdomen as you inhale, 
move up to the ribs. So it goes belly, ribs, chest. And then exhale from top to bottom, chest, ribs, belly. A couple more times. Inhale, belly, ribs, and chest. Exhale, chest, ribs, and belly. One more, inhale, belly, ribs, and chest. Exhale, chest, and ribs, and belly. Now smoothly without separating the parts. Inhale from bottom to top, chest, uh, belly, ribs, chest. And exhale, chest, ribs, belly. Now slow it down even a little more, nice and slow and relax. Inhale, belly, and ribs, and chest. And exhale, chest, ribs, belly. One more. Inhaling belly, ribs, chest. Exhale chest, ribs, and belly. And then take a pause and just notice how it feels to breathe full, deep, and slow. If you ever feel lightheaded at all from doing this gentle breath work, just return your breath to normal and bring your awareness down to your feet or your base that you established. Next, we'll do the bee humming breath. So using the breath that we just started with, you'll sip in air full and deep in all three parts. And then as you exhale, the only difference is you're gonna hum, making a humming sound and turning that humming sound internal. So lips stay closed, teeth are apart, tongue presses to the roof of your mouth and you exhale with a humming sound three times and follow your own pace, but I'll do it with you. So exhaling all the air out, take a full deep breath in and then exhale with a hum. Mm. Mm. Pause and just notice. And then the final breath practice will be a mantra repetition. It's a a mantra breath. And this one, we exhale with three sounds rather than our lips being closed. We'll allow the energy to come out and this will circulate our energy through the base of us up through the spine. So the base of us starts with the sound ha. Huh. It moves up the spine energetically with the sound re and om brings the sound full circle 
And it really helps calm, regulate the nervous system and just stimulate a very gentle flow of energy circulating the subtle pathways in the body. So I'll type it in the chat, just H-A-R-I, OM, O-M, or A-U-M. So we'll chant Hari Om three times to begin, exhaling all the air out. Take a full deep breath in and at your own pace, exhale with Hari Om. Hari Pause and notice. Shuddha dhyante bhaye shokhe Karvare varanadrite Uttu halik shuddha dhyante Brahma sakta mai dasha Ravenous with hunger, exploding with joy sneezing uncontrollably, burning with desire, reeling with amazement, staggered by grief, fleeing from danger, desperately lost. Intensity awakens wild attentiveness everywhere. Ride the shock wave inward to touch the great self, the power from which you arise. the great self, the power from which you arise. This beautiful poem meditation from Radiant Sutra's book by Lauren Roche um, is a beautiful reminder. It takes you on this journey, noticing the cravings and aversions of the senses. So it starts with ravenous hunger, exploding with joy, 
right? Burning with desire. This is one side of a polarity of emotional experience that we have. Then, which is usually what we crave more of when I we use this polarity, craving and aversion, desire and what we don't desire. So the other side of that spectrum, staggered by grief, desperately lost, the intensity awakens on both sides. So right, the emotional experience, the sense, the senses are constantly bombarded by this great polarization. And that creates uh, impulses, creates impulses in our mind, our mental emotional complexes to move towards more of what feels good and to move away from that which doesn't feel good. And what this poem is suggesting is that as that intensity of that polarity awakens, wild attens attentiveness everywhere, in the intensity of that polarity, ride the shock wave of the craving, aversion, comfort, discomfort, ride the shock wave of that inward deeply inward to touch the great self, the power from which you arise. This is the divine indwelling. This is your capital S self, your true self. Now, regardless of what your spiritual or religious beliefs are, I think we can all agree especially if we're on this call and drawn to this kind of topic, that at some point, can you agree that you've had the experience of feeling compassion, of feeling curiosity, of feeling connectedness, of feeling creative, courageous, confident, have you ever had the experience of feeling calm or patient, even if it's just patient with, an, in an external way, patient with your child, patient with life, patient with the traffic on the road, right? Being patient, having the experience of perspective or persistence or perseverance. Have you ever had the experience of playfulness? These are some of the characteristics of the great self within, of the true self. And so these, regardless, again, regardless of any spiritual or emotion or spiritual or religious beliefs, whether you call that God indwelling um, spirit, soul, true self, source, source within, jiva, <laughs> what, or paramatma, that true sense of self inside is the power from which you arise. And in another workshop, we can go more deeply into some of the philosophical spiritual aspects, if that interests anybody. But for the purposes of, of today's workshop, as we introduce some of the psychological, emotional, and spiritual well-being in this greater landscape of utilizing Ayurveda and, and healing traumatic imprints or past pains. This is where we will begin. So welcome, Joanna. Happy to see you. Blessings to you as well. Hi, Maria. Thank you for being here. Aw. Hi, Rebecca. I just saw all the new names that popped in. <laughs> Thank you for writing in the chat. So, so this is where we begin. So your, your sense, your own sense of spirituality is a keystone to healing, physical, mental, emotional trauma of any type. And it's the keystone because it is the source of healing. It is 
the source of our creation. It is the reason we are here. And it is a power much greater than ourselves. And only when we can draw upon power much greater than ourselves that we can get out of our own way, stop trying to micromanage symptoms or, you know, get stuck in a rut of whatever physical health ailment we might be challenging, challenged by. And we can start to lay the foundation of connection to that source, which keeps our heart beating, which brought us into this world, which is the intelligence inside of every single cell and organ and tissue in our body. It's responsible for our very life and it's more subtle than DNA. It can't be measured. It's immeasurable because it's infinite. And so it's a power so much greater than our minds can even comprehend. And so, connect, and, and so connecting with that as a keystone to health creates our, our North Star of healing. Because what happens in, in our physiology is that our cells follow a leader. And if the leader is the mind, well, and there's imprints that are unsupportive in the mind, well, then it's going to be led down a road of a certain type of physical experience. And I'm not saying you could be the most spiritually enlightened person and still have health challenges that, you know, karmically connected and all of that. So I'm not, none of this information is to shame or blame, but if we want to create order, we have to go to the highest order, <laughs> right? So we start with the spiritual energy which created us and allow that energy to direct and guide. And then there are physical things that we can do to help align with, with that North Star. Or if, when we think of the North Star as an analogy, the North Star is really our guiding light. The North Star doesn't tell you exactly turn left, turn right, go down this road, go this, you know, the, the North Star doesn't micromanage decisions, but it's a guiding light. If you're turned away from it, you know you're definitely going the wrong way. If we turn towards it, we at least have an orientation. It's the light that guides our way home. So home into deeper and deeper remembrance. And so we want to support our physical bodies to have deeper remembrance. We want to guide the parts of us who have forgotten that light to guide them back home. And in the same way that if you've ever grown a garden or even tended to a house plant in your home, you just have to keep showing up consistently to support the plants with what they uniquely need to thrive. And every plant is different. Every plant has some different soil requirements, sunshine requirements, exposure to daylight or shade, um, certain nutrients in the soil. Every plant's a little bit different, but they all have a lot in common. There's an intelligence inside of the seed that when watered, when germinated and cultivated, it will sprout and germinate. It will grow and it will produce, you know, grow bigger and bigger and bigger and produce flowers and fruit, you know. So our bodies are the same way. And so we get to be great gardeners of health by aligning our bodies with the um, guidelines of Ayurveda, Ayurvidya, the Ayurvidya inside of you. The Vidya is the, the wisdom, the knowledge, the Ayu is the life essence. It is the essence of all that is alive. And so there's an Ayurvidya, a a keeper of that knowledge and wisdom that lives inside of you. And you have to learn how to listen to it so that you can respond appropriately. Just like you have to learn how to watch your plants and watch the garden and respond appropriately when it needs something. And in the same way, we need to learn how to listen 
to the subtle voice and it's a subtle thing. So the, the true self, the capital S self, as we speak to it, um, this divine self is a subtle thing. It's the most subtle. And so the voice is very quiet and you have to learn how to tune into it. And it's very quiet <laughs> and it can easily be um, cut out or uh, not silenced. It's never silenced. It's always talking to you, but the other voices can get way louder and just make it hard for you to hear it. So we want to talk about how to quiet down the other voices, the ones that have inner conflict, the ones that are feel helpless, the ones that are in despair, the ones that are hurt and angry, the voices that are frustrated and fed up and tired. Those voices that are yelling and constantly on top of each other, telling you what to do, bossing you around, putting you in fear, all those voices, they're louder because they have an agenda and their agenda is not always conducive to the health and well-being of the whole. But that quiet voice is the most conducive to the health and well-being of the whole, including the individual needs of all those individual parts and voices. So the first, the first thing is just centered around this keystone of, of spirituality, of how to discern between these two voices. We said we would talk about that. You know, how do we discern between the two voices? The voice of what's true for you, the voice of your true self is quiet, it whispers, it's precise, it's succinct, it's compassionate, and it is simple. Simple, it's just a quiet truth. Have you ever had just a quiet knowing about something? You're like, I don't know how I knew that, but I just knew it, right? It doesn't speak in flamboyant, loud language. It doesn't convolute things. It's quiet, clear, and direct. And not emotional. It's just steady and consistent in its expression and it usually doesn't elaborate <laughs> we sometimes other parts of us want it to elaborate but there's just like a clear direct knowing then once you can hear that it's easy to hear it again and again and again so how you discern between all the other voices is that the other voices like i said they have an agenda they're loud they're emotional and they are they they are um, they usually leave you from the opposite of clear, confident, compassionate. <laughs> they usually leave you feeling despair, helpless, frustrated, confused, dizzy, numb, um, disoriented. So these, you know, are the other voices. And all these other voices are valid, meaning they have something to share with you. They have some way they haven't been heard. They have needs that haven't been met. And that's why they're all so loud. And um, they all get frustrated with each other. So there is a way to actually calm them down so that their needs are being met so that they can soften back and allow the voice of this true voice this voice of your inner guidance that's always talking to you, your spiritual guidance that's always talking to you to come to the forefront. And the spiritual guidance that will come to the forefront, and when it comes to physical healing, it will do a few things. It will guide you exactly how to self-care, meaning this voice will tell you exactly what to eat and not to eat what to drink and not to drink, when to sleep, when not to sleep, how much energy to expend, when to conserve. Like it's very, very simple once you break it down. But we have so many of these other voices and imprints that have come from the outside that have told us, have tried to break in, break our ability 
to hear that voice within. That voice is your greatest source of power, wisdom, insight. But unfortunately in our society today, us being you know, powerful, wise, insightful individuals um, doesn't allow us to be controlled as easy. So there have been a lot of systems in place throughout society for external power and control mechanisms. And so we just as a society, as a culture, as a people, we haven't been encouraged how to listen to that voice. And so a big part of this work, a big, a big part of this conversation is about how to listen to that voice, not only for your health, but for all aspects of life. But it starts with the very basis of self-care and self-healing. I hope this is making sense so far. So let's bring it down to the practical and tangible. So I want to give you um, a list of, um, this is from the internal family systems uh, literature, but I like these lists and they're called the eight C's and the five P's of self energy. And so you'll know, again, you know, some, as you're learning how to listen to that soft voice, that quiet voice of inner guidance, you'll know you are in self, you're seated in self, when you're experiencing at least one of these eight or five things. And I'll put them in the chat and I'm gonna, I'll speak them. Um, and Sheila asks, how do we silence the negative voices when we are weak? And I will speak to that most definitely. So here's the eight C's of self energy. And here's the five P's of self energy. And I should have written the title first, eight <laughs> C's and five P's of self energy. So this is how you know you're established in self. And so you can write these down also if you're just listening uh, auditorily. So curiosity, curiosity, compassion, clarity, connectedness, creativity, courage, confidence, and calm. So when we're feeling curious, compassionate, clear, connected, creative, courageous, confident, and calm, these are all signs that we are in self. And also when we are feeling, here are the five Ps, patience, perspective, persistence, perseverance, and playfulness. So similarly, when we're feeling patient, when we have perspective, when we are behaving in a persistent manner, when we're persevering and feeling playful and acting playful, these are also all signs that we are established in self. And there's this beautiful sutra in Ayurvedic, in the Ayurvedic texts that goes, Samadosha samagnishcha samadhatu malakriyaha prasanatmindriyamanaha svasta ityabhidiyate. This sutra is the definition of health. It goes through, the beginning of the sutra goes through you know, it says health is when someone has balanced samadosha, balanced elementals in the body. So the body is made up of five elements, ether, air, fire, water, earth. These five elements turn into the functional, their functional movements of vata, pitta, and kapha. Um, these five elements are in healthy, harmonious relationship with one another and in healthy, harmonious amounts in the body. Sama Agnishcha means um, the body's operating with healthy digestion, digestion, assimilation, absorption of nutrients and foods that come into the body, as well as liquids, 
but as well as digestion of thoughts, feelings, emotions, digestion of sensory input. You're not overusing the senses, underusing the senses, or misusing the senses, but you have wholesome and healthy sensory digestion. Samadosha, samagnishcha, samadhatu malakriyaha. You also have balance. So the body also has balanced datus. And there's seven bodily datus called rasa, rakta, mamsa, meda, astimaja, shukra, artava. So rasa is your blood plasma, the liquid of your body, the liquid that brings you to life, that feeds and nourishes all the tissues. Rakta is your blood cells. Mamsa is your muscle tissue. Meda is your adipose tissue as well as your endocrine system. Asti are your bone tissue. Maja is your nervous system tissue, all the nerves and little nerve endings, nerve plexuses, and the bone marrow actually. So all the senses that come in from skin and touch is part of your maja datu, sensory input. And then shukra in a male bodied person and artava in a female bodied person, these are the reproductive organs. So samadhatu uh, uh, means balanced, harmonious, all of these seven tissues and the way that the tissues, the kriyaha of the tissues, the way that all of these organ systems and tissues interrelate with one another, they're all functioning optimally Samadhatu mala kriyaha, as well as the three waste products. Malas are waste. So everything that you um, take into your body and all the metabolic processes in your body all have uh, excretion. They all have waste, metabolic waste that comes as a result of things coming in, things need to go out. And they leave through the three channels of urine, feces, and sweat. And so these three channels release waste out of your body. So all three channels must be dilated, open, releasing as much waste as is produced, and that is incoming. Samadhatu mala kriyaha, prasanat mindriyamanaha, swasta itya bidiyate. So this is the beautiful definition of health. So we started with all these physical things that I just rattled off to you really quick. And then we go into prasana, atma, indriya, manaha. Prasana means, in essence, it's, it's a bliss, it's clarity. It's the clarity and, and lightness, clear lightness, um, subtle bliss of the atma, which is the indwelling soul, atma, indriya, all five senses, everything that you see, hear, taste, touch, and smell, and indriya and manaha, your mind. Bliss in your senses, soul, and mind. These are all part of the definition of health. And finally, which is the predominant one that I wanted to share with you today is swasta. So then the sutra says swasta itya bidiyate. It is said that true health is the balance of all these different things and it's the bliss of the soul, mind, and senses and it is the swasta. It is you being established in your true sense of self. The self in you that is curious, compassionate, clear, always connected to the divine, connected to self, connected to others, creative, creatively inspired, courageous, confident, calm. Confident just in the, not in a puffed up proud way, but just in a in a humble way of just like, I know who I am, here I am. I have not got nothing to prove. I've got no deficits to try to fill. It's just confident knowing, a calm disposition, patient, holds healthy perspective on life and feels playful. So swasta, 
So that sutra is reminding us that the definition of health is not just how do I get rid of these symptoms? How do I fix what's not working, right? It's, it's truly the harmonious movements and interrelatedness of all these aspects of self, including bliss in the mind. What? Who knows what that even is? <laughs> bliss in the mind? Maybe we have fleeting moments of it. But that's why I say bliss in the mind is also just clarity and calmness of the mind. A mind that doesn't operate as your leader, but the Atman is the leader. Paramatma, or the true leader, the highest self, the soul, is the leader. And in that relationship with the mind, there's bliss because there's harmony. We know who we're following. We know who our North Star is, and that's true self. I hope this is all making sense. Any other questions? Sheila, I will get to your question here shortly. Um, it's part of our next section. Okay. Hmm. So then how does, how do these, how does ill health develop? And how do emotions really come into play in that? So then there's another Ayurvedic Sutra that just unfolds the six stages of some property, which is disease progression. And I'll just go over those very briefly, um, just to show you some of the ways that these aspects merge. So the six stages of disease are sanchayam cha prakopam cha prasaram stana samshayam vyaktim vedam cha yovedi doshanam sabhaved bishak. So these six stages are sanchayam cha. Sanchaya is the stage of accumulation. So basically, if those three channels of elimination, urine, feces, and sweat, aren't properly able to, or there's more work than they can actually process, they get an accumulation happens. Meaning if there's more waste in the body due to environmental toxins, undigested food, poor, poor food combining, overeating, um, overconsumption of sensory stimulus, all of these things, and your agni can't fully break it down and digest, meaning it can't fully break down and digest because of the qualities of foods that you're eating or the type of food that you're eating or the food combinations or the amount of food you're eating or how often you're eating it. If you want more details on exactly what to do for that, go back to my YouTube channel. Just a couple months ago, we did a class on reset. It's like called reset your gut through Ayurveda or something. And I talk exactly about the things to do to optimize your digestion. And that's so important in trauma healing because if we're not being nourished or if we're not eliminating toxins, then we are we will constantly be uh, overloaded <laughs> and it'll be hard to move emotions out as well because everything's connected. So um, I went off on a tangent for a second. So basically the this... Where was I? It's just fleeting. It's fleeting. Sanchaya cha prakopam cha. So accumulation. So if your digestive system and elimination system can't keep up, accumulation happens. And so basically we can just summarize it as toxins in air quotes, some kind of toxic waste. It's toxins because if there's material in your body that your body can't utilize because it wasn't fully digested, no matter what its source originally was, it becomes a, a sort of toxin in the system. It's an unusable substance. So we can call it unusable substance, or we can call it this metabolic waste, or we can just air quote it and say toxin. But that's what we mean when I'm saying, when we say toxin. So this, these talk, this substance 
accumulates. So in the first stage, then in the second stage, sanchaya cha prakopam cha prakopa means is the stage where it gets kind of vitiated and um, or it, you, we usually translate it to the word provoke. So there's a provocation. So imagine in your toilet or your kitchen sink, when it gets backed up, there's an accumulation of waste. And then what happens? The provocation is like when it fills up so much, it's filled up to the brim and it's about to spill over. So that's the prokopa stage, the, that stage of provocation. It's teetering there right on the edge. And then it does spill over. And the next stage is prasada. So it spills over. And where does it spill over to in the body? Well, it doesn't spill over to pouring all over the floor, like your kitchen sink or your toilet, but it spills over into the bloodstream in your body. So sanchaya chapra kopam cha prasaram stana samshayam. These are the first four stages. Sanchai, prakopa, prasara. Now it spills over during that provocation stage. And now this excess unusable material, toxins, it's called ama in Ayurveda, is now backed up out of the gut. The first two stages primarily happen in the gut. And then in the third stage, it spills over from the gut into the bloodstream. So now it's, once it's in the bloodstream, it's spreading. So now this is called the spreading stage, prasara. Sara means fluid, movement, it's spreading. So it's backed up and it's looking for a place to go because the whole system is so backed up. And by this point, you've experienced some indigestion, some gas or bloating, um, or it was, if you're disconnected from your body, you might not feel it, but you might have some constipation or diarrhea or IBS. It's trying to, your body's trying to, not have it spill over into the bloodstream because once it spills over into the bloodstream now it's looking for a place to deposit and that's where this fourth stage is stana samshray so stana samshray it's trying to look for a place to deposit and the this is where the emotions kind of start to come into play a little bit more because if you could imagine um if you can imagine this, this unusable material floating around in the bloodstream, it's looking for somewhere to go, but there's a gatekeeper. Excuse me one second. <coughs> I had to sneeze. So um, there's a gatekeeper at the doorway or the entryway of each bodily tissue that we said the seven tissues, rasa, rakta, ram, mam, samira, asti, maja, shukra, and artava. There's a gatekeeper that guards the cellular gateway to each of those tissues. And the gatekeeper, if they're really strong and they're really smart, they won't, they, they're like, no, no, you can't come in here. The gates are too strong. So this excess material is going through the bloodstream. So what is it doing? It's looking for a place because it, it's getting, everything's getting backed up. By the way, the, the sink or toilet never got declogged. So the, it just keeps running. It keeps running. It keeps running. It's starting to create a river down, filling up the bathroom floor and traveling down the hallway. It's got to find an outlet because all water tries to find, tries to find itself to the ocean. So it's trying to find an outlet. It's, it's going to keep flowing, but in the body, it's going through the blood and is looking for somewhere. So it's looking for somewhere to go. So the gatekeeper says yes or no. And now if the gatekeeper is weak or um, doesn't have the ability to recognize that this shouldn't come in, meaning if, so if the tissue, the gatekeeper was compromised in some way, distracted doing something else, then that's where this unusable material floods in and deposits. So stana samshraya means the deposition phase. So toxins, metabolic waste, unusable 
undigested material now becomes deposited in a tissue, which leads to stage five and six, vyakti bedam. Vyakti is stage five, and this is the stage of manifestation. So once this excess gets into a tissue, remember, it never fixed itself. So it's still backing up, still backing up. So now accumulation, provocation, spreading into the bloodstream, looking for somewhere to go. Now it's got an open gate and it just keeps going into that tissue. And it's flooding that tissue and it's depositing, depositing, depositing till the point it becomes a dis-ease. Deposit, it's fully deposited, manifested in that tissue. For example, this all happens and it gets lodged into the joints and then this becomes so stana samshrai deposition joints start getting a little stiff but you go to the doctor and there's no arthritis once it hits vyakti stage there's arthritis diagnosed in the joints as an example so and then beta is the stage the sixth stage of um, where this stage is like, it's beyond deposition, disease manifestation. This stage is, we usually translate to say differentiation. It's like when the cells of that tissue no longer look like or operate like that healthy tissue anymore. So such as the most obvious example would be a cancer cell that it completely takes over and morphs and does, is no longer a human cell. Or in the example we used of joints, that could become um, differentiation stage would look like stage, so that stage six would look like the joint inflaming and becoming deformed with really advanced, in advanced stages of arthritis. So those are the six stages. Now Western medicine is able to diagnose very beautifully stage five and six, Vyakti and Beta. Sometimes Stana Samshrai, the deposition stage can be, it's, they're called early warning signs in um, Western medicine, like high blood pressure or high cholesterol, for example. They're not like a manifested disease, but they can lead to a manifested disease. That's like Stana Samshrai. But for most of Western medicine can't pick up even on stage four, but it's very good at picking up on stage five and six. So stage one, two, three, and mostly four is up to you to learn and more subtly understand your body. So again, this is why that, that gut reset, that optimizing your bodily agni to make sure that accumulation, provocation, and spreading stages aren't happening for you so that it doesn't get to the deposition stage. But when we're merging this with, um, with the emotions and we're trying to break down and look at, okay, well, how does the emotions come into play here? It comes into play predominantly in the stana samshrai stage where the gatekeeper that we talked about um, is influenced by the emotional repression. So Ayurveda says that um, unshed tears crystallize into the disease. They crystallize into the tissues. If the tears don't come out, they go inside and they harden different tissues or they create a susceptibility in that particular tissue or um, conglomeration of tissues in a certain area of the body. So there's kind of um, some main factors around you know what would constitute a weakened tissue and in ayurveda we call this kavaigunya kavaigunya essentially translates to mean to mean a weakened space or some people translate it to mean a defective space but i think that holds a kind of weird connotation to it it's just a weakened space so whatever genetic predisposition family disposition um, past physical or emotional trauma, 
um, repressed emotions that have built up over time or tissue specific stress that was ingrained um, or lack of identity is translates to lack of identity in the tissues and those gatekeepers. So any of these factors can influence the, the those stages accumulating and depositing in there um, into the tissues. So, so this is kind of where that all segues in. Now there's another really beautiful Sanskrit um, Ayurvedic Sutra. It's the opening Sutra in this, in the ancient text called the Ashtanga Hridayam written by Vagbata. And Vagbat um, opens with this, with this prayer that many Vaidyas or Ayurvedic physicians chant at the beginning of the morning every day before they see all their clients for the day. And it's a really important reminder of what we're talking about today. So this, this and this sutra segues us into talking more about the emotions and how to, um, how to unpack uh, or how to see that in greater context. And then once we kind of unpack a little bit of this sutra, um, I will share with you the most effective methods that I've found to really resolve the pain, the triggers, the trauma, um, the illness or whatever has manifested from the root energy of the mind and emotions. And there's just a unique way that I've found over the last 12 years that's just really transformational and, and actually works. And it's also quite simple. <laughs> um, and it works. So, but let's just visit this. This little prayer is very, very, very sweet. So it goes Ragadi Rogan Satatanu Shaktan Asheshakaya Prasritan Asheshan Atsukya Moharati Tanjagana Yo purva vairyaya namos tu tasmai. Ragadi rogan satatanu shaktan ashe shakaya prasretana sheshan atsukya moharati tanjakana. Yo purva vairyaya namos tu tasmai. So this prayer essentially translates into saying it's salutation to that unparalleled physician. So it's a reminder that as someone who is healing others and and also on the path of self-healing, healing their own body-mind complex. Salutations to that unparalleled physician who has, without leaving any residue, destroyed the group of diseases that begin with raga. And I'll break down what raga means, but without leaving any residue, has destroyed the group of diseases beginning with raga, which are constantly connected with and spreading all over the body, giving rise to anxiety, delusion, and restlessness. So the very, very first sutra of the opening, and in any Ayurvedic text or Vedic text for that matter, the first chapter is always the most important chapter of that first chapter, the most important is the first paragraph of that chapter. And of that paragraph, the first, the most important is the first line. And of that first line, the most important is the first word. <laughs> so in every text, it's always the, it always distills down. And then the rest of that text 
unpacks with great detail that first line. So this very first line is speaking to, and actually the very first word is ragadi. Ragadi rogan satatanu shaktan. And ragadi is speaking precisely to raga, which is the source of all diseases, according to Ayurveda. So the end of the sutra actually is the part that says salutations to that unparalleled physician. So yo purva vaidyaya namos tu tasmai. So we're offering salutations. And if you're on a path of helping others heal and healing self, we must address raga, which is the sort without, which is from its root, without leaving any residue, destroy the diseases that begin with raga, which are constantly connected to all physiological processes spreading all over the body. And when they, and they give rise to anxiety, delusion, and restlessness. So ragadi, so we must, as students of Ayurveda, lifelong students of Ayurveda and of a genuine self-healing path that is aligned with the rhythms of nature and aligned with your uniqueness, we must start with raga. So what is raga? Raga can be looked at when we spoke earlier as desire, as, as kama, lust. We desire and we have these cravings, these things that we want more of. And then we also experience dvesha. So there's this polarity called raga dvesha, which are the two opposite poles. Ragas, you want more of, dvesha, you have an aversion to, you want less of those things, which is comes back to our poem meditation from the beginning, right? Raga dvesha. But there's a third, raga dvesha moha. Moha is also delusion. So we have, it's our own ignorance in the Ayurvedic system. It would be also tamas. It's the things that we are unaware of in our psyche. There's also, none of this is positive, negative. It just is what it is. But this polarity of raga dvesha, craving, aversion, and our own delusions, our inability to see our blind spots, um, all cause rise to disease. And in order for true health to emerge, we need to eradicate the root cause of those delusions. So raga also includes kama or lust. So um, Kroda or anger and lobha or greed. So when it comes to that polarity of that which we want more of, if we're constantly yearning for something more, we are out of the present. We are not grateful for what we have. We are feeling in despair. We are feeling out of control. We're not accepting of who we are or where we are. And what happens is when we get the thing that we want, it gives rise to lobha or greed. We want more of it. As soon as we get it, we want more. And as soon as we get that, more, 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 never ending. In, uh, in the uh, opposite or in the inverse of that, we crave something and we don't get it. It gives rise to crota, anger. We have anger and resentment and frustration that we can't get that thing that we want. So this is a trap. This is the trap of the mind. We want, we get it, it only breeds greed, more, more, more. We don't get it, breeds anger, frustration, despair. It's a trap. This is the trap of the mind. Same thing with the aversion. And it also breeds bhaya, fear. I'm never going to have what I want. I need that. Even when it comes to health, I need that, right? Fear. So constantly giving a rise to, then this, that craving and aversion polarity also gives rise to, if I, I want what I want, if I can't have what I want, it creates anger and fear, delusion, 
but it also creates envy. It also creates envy, subtle envy for those who have it. Why can't I have that too? And it doesn't always look like jealousy. Envy is a sneaky one. It, it sometimes just looks like our own despair or, oh, it's been like this for so long. How come I can't have that other person healed themselves or this other person has this perfect life, beautiful, whatever, whatever it is that you're perceiving that's what you want you don't have. And it just leads to um, envy. And then envy is a poison. All of these things are just our poisons when we continue to feed them or we don't see them for what they are. In the reciprocal of that, we get what we want. We want more, 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 more. So it can create greed, but it also creates arrogance, pride. Look what I got. I'm such a good manifester, right? But it's all external attachments to things in the physical world that are all not real because we define what's, we define real as what's eternal. So these things, this physical life is always going through the cycles of birth, life, and death, birth, life, and death, birth, life, and death. So from a Vedic perspective, it's unreal. It's not that it's invalidating what feels real to you. <laughs> and we'll talk about that in, a, in just a second as we get to the parts, the uh, um, emotional parts. But in this beautiful sutra, we're offering salutations to the healing process, uh, to, the, to that unparalleled physician who's actually able to remove raga, attachment, desire, fear, greed, envy, right? Hatred. And all of these emotions need to be um, resolved without leaving residue. It's not something we need to get rid of. I use the word, word resolved on purpose. Resolved, meaning there's a genuine sense of neutrality where they're not at the forefront of your actions, behaviors, and emotion, right? Because they physiologically act as poison in the body. And so they are subtle ama. And this in Ayurveda is called mental ama. Mental ama, ama is the toxins. We put in air quotes earlier. These are the subtle toxins. So in order to heal deeply, we just need to create resolution on these subtle levels. So how do we do that? Is this making sense? Is this interesting at all? Hope I'm not boring you all to death. <laughs> okay. So how do these, this Raga Dvesha, Raga Dvesha Moha as just like a summary, because those three words, all the mental ama, emotional things that we were just talking about. So the Raga Dvesha Moha, remember, is the polarity of of craving, aversion, and delusion. So the things I want more of, and then all the emotions that that breeds, the things I want less of, and that I'm fearful of, right? And all that that breeds, and then just the delusion of all of it, not seeing all of it clearly, not being able to hear. The moha is also not being able to hear that quiet voice we spoke of, um, because all those other voices of raga, dvesha, moha are louder. So from a Vedic paradigm, these are called raga, dvesha, moda, moha. And then um, from a therapeutic paradigm is what I want to address next. What's the, what's the therapy for this? What's the, what's the res process of resolution in that full way? What's the process of resolution? Um, and so the last thing I'll say before we get into resolution is that um, how did all of these cravings, aversions, moha, raga, dvesha, moha get there? Well, it, it's, a part of, it's a part of our development as human beings <laughs> and part of our opportunity 
as spirit beings coming into a human existence is to, we learned all these things, um, which was part of our ego development, which we don't have time to get into today, but it is under the umbrella of Sankhya philosophy, which is one of the foundational philosophies of Ayurveda, how our um, ego identity, sense of self is developed as uh, it needs to develop through as throughout childhood, it develops as an individual entity and it needs to understand I have separation between self and others. And from a spiritual perspective, it's, it's an, an emanation of spirit, just like a candle is lit and it lights all these other candles. There's nothing taken away from the original candle. And it's exactly like the original candle but each little little candle, your soul inside of you, is completely the same as the source of the candle, but it's its own unique expression and it's here to experience itself. God wants to experience God's self through you because you're a completely irreplaceable, unique expression of the divine in your form. And part of our childhood development is starting to understand naturalness of our unique form and that there's a difference between self and others. So there's this barrier and the barrier is simply ego identity. Ego doesn't mean egoic or bad or anything negative. It's just, I have an identity. There's a place where Alicia ends and the next person begins. And I know what my needs are and how to fulfill them, right? That kind of thing. So as a child, this is when this is being developed. And we also developed things that I like, things that I don't like. And we're also told from our environment what we should want for and what is good for us and what is bad for us. And then we agree with that or disagree with that. <laughs> um, or we're confused by that because it was inconsistent the way the feedback happened in our environment, right? So all these things. So, so it's a very innocent and natural process, the development of, of this Raga Dvesha Moha. And at some point, so we learned all of this. And then at some point we need to and get to unlearn the parts that are unsupportive for our spiritual development and for the health of our bodies. And so it got, it's got to come back to basics. It's got to come back to basics. When my, and I'm saying my, as all of us here on this call and this workshop, when my identity was forming through in the first seven years of my life, how was I supported or unsupported? How was I, how were my own needs met or not met? Because oftentimes the way that our needs were met or unmet during childhood is what forms the unique type of Raga Dvesha Moha you have. And so these imprints, um, particularly the ones like if there was a trauma, if there was um, inadequate meeting of your needs as a child, if you weren't accepted, if the, if the caretakers and people around you didn't come from self, didn't have curiosity about you, compassion, um, they didn't communicate clearly or they didn't have clear minds because they were using drugs or over busy with work or in conflict with their relations and their relationships. Um, you know, if they squelched your creativity if they bully if you were bullied and you you know you never got to experience the courageousness or the confidence if it was a chaotic upbringing with a lot of anxiety then you didn't learn that there I could be calm because I don't feel peaceful and safe so your nervous system you know acquires the, the opposites of what we outlined in the eight C's and the five B's, right? It, it, requi it acquires a different way of being and operating. And then because there's unmet needs and you felt invalidated or outright abused 
or neglected in certain ways, then there's deficits. And there were also things that were maybe offered or ref, um, given to you in abundance, like, you know, um, attention or money or gifts or, you know, opportunities or work or whatever it was that there was a lot that came um, and there was stuff that was deficit. So as a child, you learn like, you start to develop this, my needs aren't met, so I need more of, or this was really painful, I need to move away from that. So everything in our psychology gets sculpted by this Raghavesha and, but it ultimately creates moha because it's creating, it's, it's a veil to true self. And if we drop back in right now, just to that sincere, compassionate, curious place, because I just also gave a lot of information. My intention here is not to highlight all the things that went wrong, how they go wrong. The intention here is to really give you this opportunity to take away what's possible for you. Even though any of this happened, even though, you know, human beings have developed this Raga Dvesha, Moha, like there's still a way to be liberated from all of that, to be liberated and have resolution, liberated from the bondage of that polarity and also to have resolution in the body to resolve the emotional challenges or the physical symptoms that happen. And here are the, the, the methods that I found that are most effective for doing that um, is very holistic in its approach. So I'll share that and we're close to our time. I try to keep these workshops an hour and a half to under two hours, but two hours max, but I'm, I was trying to keep it to an hour and a half today, just because this is such a big topic. And I actually want you all to be able to just digest it, <laughs> right? So there's a lot you might want to go back to and revisit. Um, but so we'll, we'll just share. Oh, thank you, Sheila. Sheila said, brilliant, keep going, please. And uh, Joanna says, Alicia, this is great, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad, I was really hoping I'm not just boring you all to death or overloading you with information. <laughs> so when I say holistic, we're, it's become like a, a catch-all term for anything that's just like a little bit more natural than Western medicine, right? Like. But a lot of people approach seemingly holistic therapies with the same mindset as Western medicine. Like, okay, what, um, it's like the pill for an ill mentality. So in Western medicine, it's like, you have this symptom, I'll give you this pill. And then we switch out pharmaceuticals for herbs, or we switch out herbs for a diet, or we switch out a diet for, um, you know, inner child healing therapy <laughs> where we switch out, right? So it's like, um, we, when I say holistic, what I really mean is really zooming out to the whole entity and the whole being that you are, which is the definition of health that we said earlier, that we shared earlier, which is a unique constellation of elements operating and functioning in a certain way. And we wanna cater your daily habits, eating, sleeping, energy in and out, subtle energy, um, all of these things to the harmonious flow. We wanna optimize Agni, digestion, make sure that accumulation and spreading isn't happening on, on all these other levels, right? Of um, accumulation of waste products or unusable, unsupportive materials, substances in the body. So we wanna make sure waste is 
con like being eliminated, that you're being nourished. The only way the nervous system can be regulated is if you're eating regularly, drinking warm liquids, like nourishing things, regular, consistent, right? Even, um, even self energy includes persistence and consistency is one that I would add. Calm, consistency, connectedness. I'm just pulling from those eight C's. Connectedness to your own bodily needs and processes. Because even if those needs weren't met as a child, you can start meeting them now. And if you want to regulate your nervous system, and if you want to um, heal traumatic imprints from the past or rewrite, you know, those, the, the pain story that of the upbringing, then we must start treating our body with compassion through this clear lens of consistent habits. So the first part of that holistic methodology is starts with an Ayurvedic approach to regulating the nervous system, um, creating a lifestyle that is conducive to your health, well-being, and regulated nervous system. Um, basically, creates safety in the emotional body and in your physical body, and it creates a terrain. So it's like um, you're healthfully tilling the field and putting in all these nutrients so that your garden can grow. So in the same way, some of the physical Ayurvedic methods and practices are really just to support and allow the germination of the seeds of health that you're planting and you want to support those, but just that support looks different for every unique body. And so it's helpful if you can learn how to understand your unique body and to follow like a protocol that creates a foundation. And as we talked about in the last three months, the last three months, three workshops, we went into the biological pillars and the three different parts of that. We talked about energetic practices to do every day. Some of the breath work that we do at the beginning of this class is included in that. So keeping the pranic body clean and clear, supporting the digestive fire and keeping the, the physical vessel clean and clear and moving and feeling grounded and stable and safe. So that's that first foundation. Now that coupled with really effective therapeutics when it comes to the mind and emotions and all of these need to be um, approached through a spiritual lens because that's the keystone, right? So when we say the word holistic, holistic, we're talking about a spiritual lens for physical healing, a spiritual lens for mental, emotional um, digestion, transformation, regulation, and resolution a spiritual lens through all of those. And whatever your spiritual inclinations are should be honored, supported. Wherever your unique traditions are, um, religiously or spiritually should be honored and supported. And that creates keystone. But that spirituality needs to be brought into the mental, emotional healing and needs to be brought into the physical healing. And the way that I've found in psychological, emotional therapeutics for that to be the most effective is through a, um, a process that I used to, this is, a, it's very interesting how this process came to me or how I developed, started using it, but it, it, it's, we'll summarize it as parts work. So the understanding is when we have experienced in the past or child or during our childhood, um, some kind of imprint that was painful or traumatic, it creates a fragmentation of our psyche. Um, and 
in that fragmentation, a part of us almost becomes exiled or buried. And in that, in that part is storing the emotions. And it's a real living entity that you can talk to, but because it's been so hurt and it's so afraid of feeling that because it was, oh, it could overwhelm the system, that feeling, there's other protections that come around that um, painful exiled part. And these protectors show up in various ways and hold the burdens of trying to keep the emotions contained. Now, when those emotions are contained, they affect your physiology and they affect the somatic realm. They pull this, it's like, these, it's like almost as if these hidden hurt parts are pulling the strings of your physiology. It's, they are trying to get your attention because they want resolution, but the protectors are so afraid for, for them to come to the surface that they would overwhelm the whole system, that they keep you distracted. So there's lots of different ways that protectors come up, but protector, one, one protector type entity or manifestation can be in excessive researching, trying to figure out, follow all the diets, right? Like follow the perfect exercise program read, 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 read constantly. Or another protector um, could be numbing itself out from the emotions so that that part doesn't have to feel it. So it, it could be addicted to eating, overeating, um, drug use, alcohol use, anything to help numb the emotions. Um, it could be addicted to over-exercising or overworking, something that just allows it to be really engaged or into like really intense action sports, because at least if the senses stayed really stimulated, it's focused on that and not on the pain. So when we look at the, there's this whole inner kingdom, this whole inner universe inside of you that has many, many different entities and beings that you haven't met. <laughs> and they're personified parts of you that you can actually, that your true self can actually have a therapeutic conversation with because your true self is the only one that has the power and potency to heal them. And so as a practitioner, I like to empower my clients with this process of exactly how you can direct your true self to heal these managerial parts that are holding all the burdens and the exiled parts that are holding all the pain. And once that relationship is established inside of your inner kingdom, coupled with guidance around somatic experiencing and bilateral stimulation, it actually changes the brain's recall of memories and it releases all the moha, all the delusion or the veils from the experience and it brings it back to a neutral felt sense. So where you could still recall a painful memory or be exposed to an environment that would trigger or a person or something that might trigger irrationally the fear, you'll no longer have the res that response anymore, that painful response or that negative response or that fear-based response or that anger-based response. So the therapeutic process is in establishing true self and then facilitating conversation with space between true self and then these other parts of you, but meeting the other parts of you, facilitating conversation between self and these parts. And that's where having the guidance of, of a skilled practitioner who can help you do that, it will empower you for life to do that, um, to know how to do that. So I found when it comes to resolving um, chronic illness, chronic pain, symptoms that kind of like don't make sense or 
um, empaths and highly sensitive people who feel constantly bombarded by the world around them and have a hard time engaging with the world around them or just like have to feel withdrawn all the time. It, it resolves those things such that they can feel a harmonious, gentle, useful relationship with the world around them without coming from fear, without feeling overwhelmed, without feeling, you know, while resolving the symptoms. And through the, um, the foundation of the Ayurvedic um, biological pillars, it allows real transformation to happen in the emotional landscape. And it allows that freedom and that new way of being to take root in a physiology that has established safety. And that those phases are really important, establishing the safety and then establishing a, a strong sense of self. So self energy is really abundant. And then a facilitation between self and parts that are hurt or burdened. And from there, after facilitating healing conversation um, through parts that are hurt or burdened, and part of that therapeutic process is rewiring the nervous system to desensitize from the original traumatic trigger um, and also um, discharge the somatic, um, the buildup in the somatic. So that would be like the emotional experience to discharge it in a way that it, cause it's been, that it's been holding and then reinstalling in a way, this, a, a new way of being, which it's not even reinstalling, um, delete that word. What happens on the other side of an integration between true self and the hurt parts and the burdened parts. On the other side of that is just more true self, more peacefulness, more calm, more sense of self, more swasta being established in the truth of who I am. It's just, it's just there on the other side. There's more spiritual connectedness, more self energy. And once you do it once, like, and Usually just in the first few sessions with a client, we get one good experience and then it becomes easier and easier. One, one resolution experience, you know, it all depends on the ripeness of someone coming into the therapeutic setting, but within several sessions, we can start to desensitize and really move through the, the, the process of, of digestion resolution and then more self energy becomes available to them. And then more self energy becomes available. And then they start to be able to do that for themselves on their own outside of our session. And then what we do inside of our sessions is more and more refinement. So um, I kind of merged a little bit. This is my personal practice that I'm so passionate about and I love so much. And I, I get to work with the most wonderful people on the self healing who are in that self healing realm. Um, but I also want to share this with you, whether or not we ever work together one-on-one, -on -one, just to know how important it is to take this really true holistic approach where we lay this foundation of Ayurveda unique to your, your being, your biology, and your energetic being. And then we combine it therapeutically with this map of really... Um, creating healthy relationship between you and all of the parts of you that have had various experiences, traumatic or neglect or otherwise. Um, and so that's how facilitating self with these parts of you, the hurt parts and the burdened parts is where the magic happens. More self energy becomes available and Agni improves, symptoms go away because these parts of you that were pulling the strings of your physiology, trying to get your attention no longer need to do that. So the pain can resolve too. The discomfort can resolve. Whatever's not working can start working. 
So, um, oh, hi, Maria. Thank you for your note. Great information. Thank you. You're very welcome. Lots of love. And then Sheila, yep, Sheila said, or running away from pain. I'm not sure what part of my dialogue, but you mentioned that. But yeah, that's definitely can happen. Numbing the pain or running away from the pain. That's probably where you were mentioning that. Um, I want to go back to Sheila's question. How she asked, how do we silence the negative voices when we are weak? So inherent in the question is the answer. So for one, I hear your request of like, if you're feeling weak, those voices can get really loud. And so um, there's two different ways I want to answer this because for one is we never, we don't want to take the approach of silencing the voices. That's the first thing. As soon as we try to shut someone up, they feel cut off, shut down, right? Like how do you feel when someone cuts you off or shuts you up and silences you? You're, you like get more energy behind it and you just want to scream it out louder, right? So. Um, so first approach is we don't want to silence the voices at all. We want to meet them through self energy. We want ourself to meet them. Um, not another part of us who's unresourced and afraid of meeting them. We want to establish self to meet them so that they can be heard so that they don't, because what happens, and this is the second part of your question is when you're feeling weak tired, hungry, run down, overwhelmed in some way, that's when the voices can be heard because you're feeling weak. So they come in because it's maybe when you're feeling really strong and you're taking care of things and you're feeling productive, though you can't hear them, but they're actually voices that need to be heard. And so if we silence them more, they get repressed more. So we don't want to silence them. When we are feeling weak, however, so we want to recognize, we want to acknowledge them. So rather than silence them, what you can do is when the voice comes up and you're feeling weak and depleted or, or, or whatnot, the voice comes up and you acknowledge it. And you're like, I hear you. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask that you soften back so that I can revisit you when I have someone facilitating a conversation with us, when you have someone outside that's supporting your, your self energy, or when I'm feeling more resourced. So when I'm, when I get a couple, couple good nights of sleep and some good food in me, and I feel a little more grounded, you know, it can happen when we travel and we feel like dizzy and vata deranged, we come home, then everyone starts having an identity crisis. Oh, what should I do with my life? And I don't have enough money and I don't know what to do with my career. It's like when you're depleted, overworked and you know running around, you're not gonna feel clearly because you're not gonna hear clearly or see clearly because you are in a weakened state and you need to regain um, some physical strength so that you can have a calm, clear approach. <laughs> Right. So don't try to make any major life decisions or fix any major problems in your life when you're feeling depleted or if you're a woman, when you're on your moon or, you know, like this is when your energy is just low. You just witness, just witness and notice. So Sheila, when the voice comes and you're feeling weak, don't silence it. Just witness it, witness it and request possibly that it softens back so that you can revisit it another time. But if you tell it, you're going to revisit another time, you better revisit it another time when you're feeling resourced. Otherwise the voice start, that part starts to not trust you. And then it starts to get louder and louder and try to get your attention in other ways. Um, I hope that helps. Any other questions for today, loves? It's been such a, such a sweet, class with you all today. Thank you for your engagement and your, um, and listening. <laughs> I talked a lot today. I should, sh I should go be quiet now.
you don't have any more questions, then um, we will wrap up for today with a little final prayer. Uh, you're welcome, Sheila. Um, and, you know, if any of you want, uh, are feeling called to do, have a facilitator in that realm, and you want to consider working together over several sessions or several weeks or months of sessions and like a program of actual care to facilitate this transformation. Um, this is what I specialize in. So today was a really special class. Every class is really special, but um, everything that we talked about up until this point is about the creating safety of the biology. But this unique addition with the, the emotions and how to really facilitate transformation healing and resolution within the different parts of you that are having different conversations, the parts of you that have been hurt, the parts of you that are burdened, um, then, and you feel like you'd like to explore working together, I'm gonna, I can give you my calendar link and just reach out to me. I'll give you my email address and my calendar link. And um, introductory sessions are just 45 minutes, just kind of checking in and exploring your needs and if we would be a good fit to work together. And I'll also give you insight on what's going on so you feel clear on the direction to take. And then um, from there, if we're a good fit to work together, we can talk about what that looks like, which is very simple, straightforward and accessible to people. Um, I have a totally new therapeutic model than I did in the past which was very program-based, short-term, you know, type of work that I did with clients in the past. And I find that it's very accessible now for people. So um, it's simple, straightforward, and effective. And I love to empower you. My intention is to empower you so much so that you don't need me anymore, <laughs> that you don't need a practitioner anymore. And um, it's always nice to have outside support. And so you can always continue, but we do an intensive, you know, one-on-one -on -one immersion together. Um, we, you pick the amount of time, we do that together. And then you can just call upon me in the future whenever you just need a refinement or a tune-up or just a check-in and, um, and yeah, just get you the support you need with whatever health condition you might be dealing with or, with whatever um, emotional imprint challenge that you might be dealing with. So it would be an honor to support you. So there's my calendar link and it only books two weeks out. So if you don't see anything in the next two weeks that works in your schedule, just email me um, at hello at alishalindiaz.com. And the calendar link is also, if you're watching this on a recording, it's, it's below the video calendly.com um, link. So um, I look forward to seeing you all next month where we'll, we'll continue unpacking these beautiful topics um, around holistic healing, trauma healing, therapeutic methods, meditating together, contemplating together. And um, yeah, lots of love to you all. Remember, mark your calendars for first Wednesdays of the month. Every first Wednesday, same time as today, same Zoom room as today. And I'll, you're, if you're here, you're on the email list, so you'll also get a little reminder. So closing prayers, just sending out love and supportive healing energy to all beings and all levels of existence. Loka samasta sukino bhavantu Om shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Blessings to you all. Lots of love. I look forward to seeing you soon and hope to see some of you one-on-one -on, -one on my calendar in the next couple weeks. All right. Blessings. Bye.